Matthew Nagler, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you so much for having me back on again, Howie. Yeah, we, we're going to talk about, I think it's your latest Substack article, uh, which you called Fake It Till You Make It. Um, yeah, so I did not create that phrase, obviously. It's actually been around for a while. But what I wanted to do was the phrase kind of conjures this notion that through actions, we can transform our lives just by taking an action, sort of letting our actions get out ahead of our, how we feel about, you know, whatever it is we're doing. And, and that that can somehow be transformative. And what I wanted to do is sort of tie that in. And this is kind of what I try to do with my Substack typically, is I wanted to tie it in with something, uh, something economic. And uh, it so happens that there's been recent uh, research that suggests that actually, uh, you know, something that's sort of consistent with this, that our actions influence our preferences. Um, so I can I can go a little bit more into that, but but economists have traditionally uh, conceived of so we have this sort of very traditional microeconomic theory of, of behavior whereby people have these preferences and the preferences are are fixed. You're basically you know you're given your preferences. It's kind of like you wake up in the morning and you like what you like, and yeah. based on those preferences we make choices. And the choices are also constrained by other things that are outside of our control, our our budgets and other limitations that we have. And so essentially that's the economic model of decision-making um, that, you know, that preferences determine actions. And um, I, I think this is, you know, so this, this is kind of fine as far as it goes, it's very scientific, but I think if you think about sort of being a human being, having to live that reality, I don't think it's a life worth living. <laughs> and, and the reason is, I mean, if your preferences are kind of something that you just kind of are given and your choices just follow from them and from your budget, then there's really not much room for, I mean, the decisions that you make are just going to be, you know, just sort of automatic. You're, you're, you're basically a machine. And, uh, and, and, and so, so where's the joy in that? And, but, but what's very interesting is that there's actually a lot of recent evidence, psychological evidence in particular, that, um, that in fact, not only do preferences determine actions, but our actions actually influence our preferences. Yeah. So let's let's unpack all of that. We've got a, we've got a fair amount of time. Um, so I'll begin with sort of there, there's been an evolution of of a kind of understanding of the phrase "fake it till you make it," which like like everything that's sort of pithy, it has wisdom in it, and it also you know, there's, you know, somebody's going to make money with a backlash saying, actually, you know, this good advice is terrible advice. So, you know, the idea that, okay, you get to do things that aren't authentically you on the way to becoming authentically you is, is a good thing. That if, if the only way that I get to be authentic is doing things that come naturally, then I'm probably never going to get toilet trained right? so, at some <laughs> level, right? Then, exactly. Right. I'm going to like, you know, flick my boogers at people. I'm going to say whatever pops into my mind. Like that was all authentic. And there are days where it still feels like that's the real me. And, you know, and I'm wearing this, this social mask of acceptability, which is, you know, it's just very much like the Freudian theory. Like we have this, seething, roiling, unconscious of violence and sex and possession and power. And because we have to live with each other, we, you know, we, we tamp it down and we get taught the, yeah, the process of growing up is, is, is tamping it down. So there's this idea that, you know, that, that our preferences, that we can modulate them by repression. And that's the only that's the only options. Either just let it all hang out or put a lid on it. Right. And and so yeah. So I guess you're right. I mean, what you what, you, what essentially I think I, I hear you pointing out there is that we do sort of we we have this. I think we have this sense that our actions do kind of uh, influence our preferences, at least you know, sort of on this kind of sublimation or repression level, right? So that so that I may you know I may have these you know this 
I have this id, right? I don't know. I'm not like really a Freudian, but I have this sort of this inner drive to do things and I'm constantly tamping it down and keeping it under control. So I'm working to, to, you know, to filter what my real preferences are through the controlling influence of, of actions that I take or, or, or a shut off valve of a sort. Right. But I, but I, I think there's something kind of grander and more exciting in, in this idea of uh, fake it till you make it. And, and, and it has to do partly with, um, with the fact that we, by, uh, when we observe what we do, when we observe the actions that we take, we infer something about ourselves. So if we go about doing certain things or not doing certain other things, we infer that we're a certain kind of person. So like if I've never gone running before, I may say, I may see people run and they may say, oh, I'm, but I'm not a runner. You know, I can't do that. I've, and why? Because I've never seen myself do it before. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I can't conceive of myself as a runner. So, but the, the, so, so what do you, you know, so if you want to, so anyway, there's, it's not just about running. I mean, there's, there's, there's any number of things that we may say, oh, I'm that kind of a person because I've seen myself do that. And I'm not that other kind of a person because I've never seen myself do that. It, this is related to uh, the theories of a psychologist, Daryl Bem from the uh, early 1970s. Um, is there's a literature on, and he's, he's sort of the main person on self signaling, you know, and, mm -hmm. and it's funny because, <clears throat> you know, there's a moral, there's a moral component to this. Sometimes we contemplate doing something and, you know, like, well, think about, you know, like doing something that's sort of on the moral edge for us, like, um, you know, maybe lying to someone about something, maybe a white lie, not a very big lie, but a small one. And, 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 and often people sort of, you know, see those things and they say, well, if I did that, what kind of a person would that make me? Mm. And that, you know, and, and so that's a way in which we kind of recognize that we're signaling ourselves. We, 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 we know that if we take a certain step, it could transform who we are in a, in a, in a, or, you know, our perception of who we are in a direction that we don't want to go. And so, and so we have that kind of, you know, concern about that, which I think is in many cases quite reasonable if we're moral people. Um, but on the other hand, uh, this fact that we are signaled by, we, by what we've done in the past can be limiting if we don't try to play with it a little bit. And so how do you play with it? You play with it by taking dramatic steps to do things with which you at first feel completely uncomfortable, just trying them out and giving them a chance to stick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are, I want to kind of come, come back to other uh, challenges to this idea that, that we have control over our preferences. Right. So one was the, the Freudian, like we have control, but only in an inhibitory way. Like, you know, the heart wants what the heart wants. And right. <laughs> and other, and other, and other parts of us want what they want as well. <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, another so and Freudianism is more or less out of fashion. What is in fashion in my world is evolutionary psychology, um, which talks about preferences at this whole other level. And it sounds very scientific, like, OK, you know, so you you have this preference for survival. You have this preference for, you know, finding the best possible mate. You have this preference for eliminating your competition for that mate. You have, a pre you know, so that, that basically this veneer of humanity is like, you know, we're basically, you know, bonobos or, or you know, uh, oysters or like any other creature. We're following these, um, you know, evolutionarily, genetically deterministic path. And we just have the brains to like fancy it up a little. Like, you know, we, we can talk about Maseratis. Right. You know, it, it, when, you know, even though everybody knows the Maserati is just about sex. That's right. It's 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 your it's your inner uh, lizard uh, speaking. I, I actually that's been written. I, I there's a book that I've read that that specifically uh, writes about uh, SUVs, large SUVs and their popularity, particularly during the first decade of this 
of this millennium um, as being related to sort of, you know, this inner kind of reptilian drive to dominate. Um, so yeah, that's right. There's technology that's today that's, you know, that this is human technology and, 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 but, but, but really, are we just doing anything different from what our, our inner drives are, are telling us to do? All right. So when you, when you talk about preferences, you know, you mentioned the example of being a runner versus not being a runner. Uh, you know, we can talk about, you know, in your article, you talk about, you know, I'm the person who makes food because I've seen, you know, or, you know, you know, as people are listening to this to think about their own identities and another popular phrase in the self-help world is like limiting beliefs, which is kind of what we're talking about. Like I, you know, um, where do I want to go with this? Here, 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 here's, here's where I want to go with it. You start the article by talking, by using the example of becoming a meditator even though you started meditating and it was horrible and it's like, this is the worst thing in the world. Why would anyone ever want to do this? Yeah. But you, you know, you get to a point, you, you say you've gotten to a point and I'm paraphrasing where, where basically you kind of transcend your own identity. Yeah. And, well, there's two, well, well, yeah, yeah, go on. I'm sorry. I didn't want to interrupt. Yeah, no, no, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say there's two, there's really two parts to that. So, so one part is the identity part, which we've been talking about so far, the self signaling. Okay. If I see myself meditate every morning for 10 minutes, Eventually, I'm like, well, gosh, I guess I'm a meditator. You know, I'm seeing myself doing this. And so and so once once you can kind of see yourself as that kind of a person, then um, uh, it becomes it becomes easier uh, to like it because it's 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 kind of a part of who I am. And it's like, you know, you, you, you habituate to it in, in an identity sense. But there's another layer to it, and that is actual physical and psychological learning. So if you sit on a meditation pillow for 10 minutes a day and you do it for long enough, eventually you get better at sitting still and you get better at focusing on your breathing. And so there's, there's learning happening that's happening that's physical and there's learning happening that's psychological or mental. You're learning things. And, and, and so some of this, you know, especially the physical component, isn't even happening on a conscious level. It's it's partly it's muscle memory. Um, I think one activity that's very much illustrative of that, which I've also kind of learned at one point not that long ago in 2017, in fact, is windsurfing. Um, I I took yeah at one point I mean so years ago when I was like in my 20s I I think I took a, a windsurf board out you know somewhere like the Dominican Republic and just tried to get on it. And it was like, I, I, you know, I made a few attempts and I couldn't stand on the board and I was like, oh, this is stupid. And I didn't even, I just kind of gave it up. But then, uh, so about, you know, now it's like seven years ago, uh, we, we were in Lake Garda, uh, in, in Northern Italy. And I, I'm like, okay, I'm actually going to take a lesson with a professional in, in windsurfing. And, and my son, Josh did it as well. And, um, and, and the beginning of it was really uh, painful and punishing, I have to say, like the first hour or two. I must have fallen off the surfboard literally a hundred times into the water, you know, and I've got a, 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 a fifth, you know, at the time I had like a 50 year old body and I'm like, this is really punishing to constantly be falling off this board into the water. And it, it got to the point where it was almost like laughable. I was like, here we go again. And I was just laughing at myself. And somewhere in there, my muscles learned something. I kind of transcended the moment that I had been in where I was like, this is impossible. So impossible. It's laughable. And I got to a point where I was like, wait a second, I think I'm picking something up here. And certain things almost imperceptibly became easier. I can't even put my finger on when it happened, but it started to happen. And before I knew it was happening, I was doing this thing. Um, so, and it was fascinating because largely because a lot of what happened was not on a conscious level. Okay. It's like something happened just from the doing that then brought things into line for me. And so, so anyway, this second component, apart from this, so we talked about, you know, self signaling and seeing yourself and your identity, this other thing, the learning, once you learn to do something, it gets easier for you and more comfortable for you. And, and, and when something is more comfortable, it's easier to like, and especially not even, it's not even a level of comfort. It's, 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 it's when you engage in an activity and it feels fluid. Okay, there's a certain mm -hmm. flow to it that it becomes enjoyable. 
And of course, so when you start trying to windsurf, it's not like that at all. But once you start to get the muscle memory, then the flow starts to kick in and it becomes enjoyable. And then, and so that's where the preference change occurs. You start to like it. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a great example. Um, because you can't make yourself learn it. Right. In fact, I'm, I'm, you know, there may have been a time where your ego was like, darn it, I'm going to get this, going to get this. Yeah. It's like, and now I'm going to stand up and do it. Right. <laughs> it's like, no, that doesn't work that way. <laughs> right. Like you, you, you almost have to give up the, the, you just keep putting yourself in the situation and your mind is going to figure something out. And yes. the less your the less the part of ourselves that we think of as I is involved, the, the more, you know, painless, the evolution and probably the quicker. Yeah. And it, it, it's interesting because, you know, sort of as we, as we talk about this, I'm sort of thinking about what are some of the key elements to that? I think you're right about taking your I out of it, your, you know, I, the letter I, me out of it. And, and part of what happened to me with the windsurfing experience was, I think, I, and here I'm just, again, I'm sort of thinking out loud. When I, when I got to the point where I realized I have fallen off this board dozens of times and I started to laugh and say, hey, here we go again, I think a unique thing happened, which is that I started to look down on myself, not down on myself, but look at myself as if from above, as if I was watching myself as a separate person. I kind of, I, I was like beside myself. You know the expression, I'm beside myself? I was beside mm -hmm. myself in more ways than one. I was like just, I was beside myself, but I was also beside myself and I was looking at myself. And, and so when I was outside myself, it, it, I, it, it, was, it was at that time, I think during that period of, of sort of, you know, you know in, it, which was relatively intense that, that I made the transition. Hmm. And what comes to mind for me is, so I'm studying um, a, a process of, uh, it's a sort of hypnotherapeutic process with a guy named John Connolly, who talks a lot about like I and myself and what and his definition of self is, you know, basically um, Danny Kahneman's, you know, system two, or, or rather, rather, you know, um, well, the I'm confusing the systems, but basically the part that's not the unconscious part that, you know, that does things very efficiently, that can handle respiration and blood oxygen levels right. and driving the car while you're on the phone, everything that's that's sort of not I and, you know, that can multitask, that can ha that can handle everything while the I gets overwhelmed if I'm on the phone and someone in the room is trying to talk to me at the same time, and like steam comes out of my head. Right. Right. So, yeah. so the way in like trusting this, like getting the eye out of the way and the self is like, okay, we we're, you know, <clears throat> we're a prediction machine. We we're predicting, right? Like the reason you fall off the windsurfer is that in every other situation you've ever been in, the way to stay upright was to do X and here X tips your ass in the water. Right. That's, that's an interesting way of looking at it. But now sort of bringing Danny Kahneman's two systems into it, though, that sort of autopilot system, remember, is, uh, and, and this is sort of one of the recurring themes in Kahneman's work, that autopilot system is prone to certain predictable errors. You know, it, it uses it uses simplifying approaches that Kahneman and his, uh, his, his, uh, his late collaborator, Tversky, referred to as heuristics. And, and so these processes, so, so, I mean, so for one, for one thing, when you're not having to think about things all the time, it does make them easier and it does make them more straightforward. But on the other hand, uh, you, you can be prone to the, to the errors that, that are naturally kind of bred into that system. So it's, it's, it's in those situations that the other system, and I can never remember which one system one or system two either, but the other system <laughs> comes in and has, and, and imposes kind of a, you know, a, um, an oversight where it, it corrects those errors and says, no, no, let's work on this a little bit more carefully and get this right. Um, mm. So, so I think there's a certain pleasure to, to not having that, you know, to being that I, if, if that's what um, if your friend John Connolly, I think you were saying was, was talking yeah. about, there's a pleasure to that, but, but, but every so often we do have to, we do have to sort of attend in that, in that kind of oversighted way. And I, I think, you know, I also think there's kind of a, 
there's kind of two sides to this. I think there's a pleasure in sort of being, you know, being able to use your muscle memory and just do, do something by gut like that. But then there's also an enjoyment to, to things that we uh, uh, attend to very, very um, consciously and sort of, you know, really with great focus. Those can also mm. be pleasurable in a different way. Yeah, and I think it, all, it really depends on, like windsurfing is a particular type of learning yes. that's probably different from like me arguing with my wife about <laughs> X. <laughs> like there are elements in common. <laughs> yeah, they all end up with me ending up in, in hot water a you know, hundred times. <laughs> no, but there is, there is like there, um, the self with these heuristics you know, they have, they have the data set that I bring to every relationship goes back to pre-verbal times. Yeah. Like, you know, the way my father would get upset when anyone was in the, in the house was arguing. Sure. Right. Like, like, they, like my, that part, there's a prediction about that got generalized. And I think we all do this, right? We all have our, yeah. you know, attachment relationships and early relationships and experiences. And if we have traumas, that really get imprinted big and loud, then we generalize. Everything else is, you know, about this. So some somebody, you know, who windsurfs could probably handle a whole bunch of other, situ you know, riding a bike, mountain bike down a trail, right? And and be like, okay, I get this. But like when I'm a tennis player and I'm trying to learn squash, all I do is bad habits, and there I need to kind of intervene with the eye to at least slow myself down um, yeah I, because I, of the prediction yeah. engine is off i think i hear what you're saying i mean we have to kind of okay so we have to kind of nod to the fact that there's 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 a lot sort of inside us that's already imprinted that's going to influence what we what we do and uh but but i think you know sort of the beauty of this idea of fake it till you'll make it is that um I think we have a tendency, I think many of us have a tendency to believe too much that we are what we've, what we've been, you know, what, what has happened in our life so far, that that mm -hmm. is who we are, that we are what we learned as children, that we are what we are, feel comfortable and know how to do now. And, but I, I think, I really think that, that there's much more possibility. And I think that you can, you can, you can see that possibility if, if you're willing to to take a chance on 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 doing things that you know your gut is telling you are are not what you've learned before not who you are mm -hmm. uh you know so you know i guess on a certain level some of those old habits like if you're the if you're the squash player trying to learn tennis or vice versa are gonna are gonna break in but but also through persistence you can overcome them so i you know that that squash player can learn to play tennis and um, it may be a little bit harder and you kind of, you know, accept that, but, but you kind of laugh through it and you're going to get there, uh, it, it, you know, or in many cases you can. Yeah. My friend Peter Bregman talks a lot about a great learning opportunity is high perceived risk, low actual risk. So I imagine that your body, yourself, was perceiving some risk in windsurfing, like falling at a quick speed. Like, okay, yeah, like, you know, okay, this is water, I can survive water, right? So, but I think, you know, part of it might have been just, just being, like, falling, like, being okay, like, falling a hundred times taught you, okay, I can fall 101 times, this is not a matter of survival. <clears throat> what just came to me, I, I don't remember if you were in the class with me, but we were, it was in uh, junior high gymnastics, mm. and... Um, Mr. Ruggiero <laughs> might have been the, the gym teacher. And yeah. <clears throat> was he either eighth or ninth grade? At one point, I can't remember, you know, uh, who you else. You had who? I had Mr. Spidell. You remember Mr. Spidell? I do. I do. My, I, I know he was, he, I had him for wrestling. Okay. That was, that was the worst quarter of my life, <laughs> having to do wrestling. I think I had Mr. Ruggiero for wrestling, actually. Okay. <laughs> so I think, I think I had Mr. Ruggiero for, um, well, the podcast listeners are getting their money's worth here. <laughs> um, 
We, and you had we had to do all these different gymnastics routines, and the, you know there was you know rings. I remember like Michael Mead was able to do like the Iron Cross, and we're like, well, uh, well, you know the reason that we remember that is because there's that yearbook picture of him that he's where he's up there going, you know, he's <laughs> okay <laughs> for eternity. So whenever you open the yearbook, the first thing you see is Michael Mead on the rings. <laughs> <laughs> all right, good. That's how memory works. So th- what I was remembering, like, okay, I was okay on the floor X. You know, I was still doing, you know, baby stuff, but I could do a, like a forward roll and a backward roll. The um, the thing I could not do was the vaulting horse. Mm. And I remember like running at it and you're supposed to like sort of jump, put your hands down and then and go over the the, the horse. Mm-hmm. And everybody was like, it's, in, in my mind, everybody was doing it. Mm-hmm. And also in my mind, I was I was tall. I was one of the taller kids. Yeah. I was very athletic. I was fast. I saw myself as like, you know, a high level athlete compared to like gym class. And I just kept running into the end of the horse with my belly because mm-hmm. I could not lift myself up because I was sure I was going to land on my nuts and die. <laughs> and there was, there was there was nothing anybody could do. Yeah. You know, the teacher was like really frustrated. Like, why? I, and I, I simply like my body was putting on the brakes as just as if it was it was asking me to like run across a four lane highway and i and i to this day like i don't you know i don't know how i could how anyone could have helped me with that and with that prediction error and it was clearly an error because there's no question had i jumped i would have made it all the way yeah 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 i mean there's listen i mean we're prop even even with our ability to sort of expand what we can do i i i think there are going to be some things that are going to be more challenging for all of us, you know, as, as jumping over a vaulting horse was for you and, and for whatever particular reason, there's, you know, things will be easier for us. Some things will be easier for us than others. Mm-hmm. But, but, but the funny, I mean, the funny thing is, you know, sort of, we, we look at ourselves as you just looked at yourself and you said, well, this was something that was impossible for me. And so, and so, and so there was a, there was a, um, you know, a, uh, a self-perception thing going on there. You, you kind of, have looked at, at what you've done and, 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 and your past experiences and, and made a judgment there that this is naturally something that, 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 is, that is difficult for me. And so, so even in that assessment, there's that sort of imposition of, 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 that, of that judgment based upon past experience. So, and this is where, this is where maybe if you go to the gym right now and just like put all of that aside and just try to vault over that horse, you know, you could surprise yourself. Yeah, I mean, it's, what just came to me as you're saying that is like, couldn't they have a horse that was half the length? Like, I would probably, I could have done that. Like, if you just increased it by an inch, right? And I think that's that's one of the lessons of that you talk about in "Fake It Till You Make It" is that there are incremental strategies that can end that can you know turn into a, a a transformation that you might not even recognize. Yes, that's true. There are incremental strategies. And in the case of so meditation is, you know, from for me, that's the example that sort of illustrates this is that I just kept at it and and I didn't have to do an hour or two hours a day, you know, as the as the as the Zen koan says, you know, um, you must meditate for one hour a day. If you don't have time to meditate for one hour, then meditate for two hours. Now, I neither I never had to meditate for one hour or two hours to learn meditation. I meditated for 10 minutes a day, but I just kept at it. And so there's an incrementalism to that there. You know, there's no there's not much cost involved in meditating for one more day. Just keep going, you know, and then eventually it could kick in. But but I don't think every single instance and in fact, some of the most dramatic and exciting instances of fake it till you make it, I don't think are incremental. I think they are. I think there's a discontinuity. There's mm-hmm. there's a leap. And in the in the piece, I talk about the movie Shall We Dance, um, 1996 Japanese language movie in which a mild mannered Japanese businessman who I mean, that's basically his perception of himself. He thinks, you know, I'm sort of mild mannered and I'm, I'm a businessman decides to take up ballroom dance and it's completely out of character for him. He knows it's out of character for him. And one of the things that allows him to turn the corner is his instructor says, when you go out on the dance floor, in particular during the competition, make your first step a bold one. And he's, and he, you know, immediately shrinks. He's like, I I don't think I can do that. 
But then when the moment comes, you know, you're watching the movie and you see him do that. He actually makes this bold step onto the floor and you know it's a bold step and you can see that he knows it's a bold step. And there's actually a kind of a, almost, there's a, there's a discontinuity there. There's a kind of a, a leap where in that moment he was transformed. And you know, and there's not, I don't think there's anything incremental about it. I'm sure it was mm -hmm. extremely, you know, it, it, this is job, obviously a fictional movie, but, but I think if you're in that situation, there is something terrifying about that moment. But if, if and when you can do it, it's an amazing moment. Um, and, and I think we can, you know, I think we can probably all think of examples of, of something that we've done that was like that. And they're very memorable moments. And sort of my point, one of my points in the piece is that we should recognize that these moments, partly because they are so frightening, are so transformative. And we shouldn't shrink from the opportunity to, 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 to take those, uh, those leaps. Hmm. Yeah. Well, um, I'm thinking about the, um, my understanding of how learning and change happens from a, from a neuroscientific perspective, something called memory reconsolidation, where, um, you know, we, we basically, we basically learn everything through prediction error. Right through the mismatch. Right. Okay. If, if I right. if I predict X and it happens, I've reinforced something. I haven't learned something. Yes. Right. Right. But if, I, if it's like, oh, that's different. Like, oh, I'll try this and I fall over, or I hit this squat, this shot, and it it's, it lands perfectly. Like, okay. So the mismatch cre creates, you know, the the error put brings our attention to it, and it kind of it's almost like double clicking an Excel. Uh, cell that you can't change something in an Excel spreadsheet until you've clicked on it. Mm -hmm. And so, the, so the memory reconsolidation is like, you know, the memory, the, the, the existing memory is up and gets disconfirmed by something. Yes. And I think that's, that's what you're talking about. It's like when, when, when mild mannered Japanese businessman takes a bold step at that moment of really heightened emotionality and, and high stakes, that step just rewrote what was in the cell of, <laughs> of his memory. And, 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 and it can't be, you know, at, at that point, the old perception, at least in that situation, is erased and replaced with another one. So that the next time he does a dance competition, he will naturally take, you know, that's who he is now, the person who takes the bold step at the beginning of his routine. Yes. Yes, that's right. I think I think that's right. I think it's 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 and I, if I may just sort of modify this slightly, um, sort of sort of my understanding of learning theory is that there's 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 a whole spectrum of of things from sort of dramatic to small, and um, so those situations where you where you do something that's confirmatory, there's learning involved as well. Um, it's uh, in, in economics we call it Bayesian updating. OK, so if I have a belief which I'm 90 percent confident in and then it's confirmed by new information, now I'm 95 percent confident. So there was learning even when it's confirmed. OK, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and so and so everything, everything induces learning. But the most dramatic learning occurs when there's a surprise. OK, and so when you take an action that is 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 different from your conception of yourself, there's a bigger surprise. And so it's a more dramatic, dramatic rewrite, I think. Okay. Ooh, that is so helpful. Bayesian updating. I'm going to, I'm going to toss that into casual conversation now. To the, <laughs> You'll start to, to sound like an economics, of... uh, econometrics <laughs> in no time, you know. <laughs> I just want people to think I'm smart. That's the, that's the underlying <laughs> goal of all this like stuff. Economist, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could also, Bay, Bayesians are not just economists, right? It's, no, no, no. Bayes is, Bayes was one of the most probably one of the most influential, uh, you know, uh, people in the, of the last millennium. I mean, you know, along with Einstein, I mean, yeah. Bayes, Can you explain this Bayesian, like, probability, like this yeah, stuff to me? I, I can, I can, yeah, I can kind of, I can kind of do a quick thumbnail of it. So, 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 um, so Bayes, you know, and I'm going to get this wrong. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to quote, you know, information about him, but my recollection is that he was, I think he was, I think he was in a monastic order. I think he was, you know, he was, he was, you know, 
but I could be wrong about that. And I think he lived during the 17th century, but I could be wrong about that also. But anyway, what he what he did is he created he, he, he sort of created some probability rules and some basic formulas that allow us to sort of think about how um, how we should, you know, um, how we should update our, 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 our notion of the likelihood of something based upon new information. OK, so uh, and in fact, his his formula or I guess what, I don't know if he actually derived it, but it was attributed to him, which is what we call Bayes' rule, actually gives us a formula for, for um, you know, so how, how to do this kind of updating. And to give you an example, let's say that you, uh, somebody shows you a coin and says, I'm, I'm going to flip this coin. And if it comes up heads, I'll give you a hundred dollars. If it comes up tails, I'll give you zero. Now you don't get a good look at the coin. And in the back of your mind, you think, Maybe this coin's got two tails. Maybe I'm, I'm going to be had here. And if I, you know, usually this kind of offer doesn't get just made like that. It gets offered like, well, if you, you know, give me $50, we're going to flip a coin and it'll be a hundred if you get heads, right? So, yeah. uh, so, so you're thinking the person on the street is probably, you know, maybe there's a probability that this head, this coin has two tails, right? And maybe, so you go in with a certain probability. Maybe you go in thinking, I think it's about 20% likely that this coin has two tails and 80% likely that it's a fair coin. And you probably only put 20% on it because, you know, usually coins, when you see them, they're fair. So what is the chances that this coin is going to be, have been concocted to have two tails? So you play this game a few times. The first time it comes up tails and then it comes up tails again. And then it comes up tails again. Now, every time it comes up tails, you can you revise your probability that the coin has two tails and you revise it upwards. And what Bayes rule does, what, what sort of Bayes came up with is this is this rule for how a rational person would update their probability based upon mm. knowing the probability that a fair coin would come up heads or tails. And um and 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 starting from this initial probability, which we call the prior, for the coin having two tails. So you start from the prior. We all start with priors, okay? You know, like when you meet a new person, and uh, you know, and and that person looks a certain way, you you come up with priors about like, oh, I, have, I my prior is twenty five percent that this person is uh, you know a below average intelligence. Or so, so is another, is another word for prior prejudice? Yes, that's well, that's a it's an application of the term prior. Yes. Uh -huh. A prior so form of a prior is a yes. stereotype or a prejudice. Exactly. So a prior mm -hmm. about a person very often can be a prejudice. And so, so what Bayesian updating says is that as we, as rational people, and this is actually, I'm, I'm glad we're taking this slight detour here because it, it, it's very interesting what, what, what sort of comes of using, applying Bayes' rule to this idea of prejudice. What, Bayes, what, what Bayesian updating tells us is that a rational person confront, you know, confronted when, in, when you initially meet somebody who looks a certain way to you, you have prejudices. But as you observe that person behave, you update and your prejudices vanish and are replaced by the, 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 the real results of the data that you observe. If you have a prejudice that a certain person is below average intelligence and then you observe them over time, you say, ah, okay, no, they're not. This is actually a smart person. And you revise and over time, you're eventually going to gravitate towards truly who they are. You're going to see the person for who they are. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now that's a, that's, that's, a, that's a very nice idea. But uh, one of the things that in behavioral economics that, 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 that we've learned is that, um, is that in many situations, people don't actually update according to Bayes rule, that people have a tendency towards what we call uh, confirmation bias. So that even though new information comes in that should cause us to update, we suppress information that is dissonant with what we want to believe or what we, you know, what, what we basically have our thumb on the scale to believe. And then we tend to, when, when information comes in that's consistent with it, that's constant, we put more weight on that. Okay? Mm -hmm. And this fact shows that very often, you know, in certain situations and for certain reasons, people don't update. Mm. Yeah, it was, as you were speaking, I was thinking about the difference between like rational updating and emotional updating. And I've read, you know, sort of um, studies of comparing humans to other animals in terms of like, we, like a game where you have to you know, pick a card from one deck or the other deck and you get certain rewards for certain things. And that, that if you just do it long enough, 
you're gonna, you're gonna, you won't even, you won't realize that one of the decks is better than the other, but you'll pick it from that deck more often. Interesting. And like pigeons do this better than people. Like people are much, or you know, monkeys do. Like lots of species will will update. Yeah. Even without, like humans are not that great at, at updating compared, we, we do it, we don't recognize why we do it, but we're a lot slower than other species in, in, in terms of- We have um, the cerebral cortex. So, so a greater portion of our brain is not, is, not, is not, you know, processing for instinct. So these other animals have, have a much, you know, they have much greater instincts than humans do. Human, human instincts have sort of been replaced by this tendency to you know, to have to consciously process these things. Mm. You know, so you get the story yeah, about but... the, the cat jumping on the hot stove, right? I mean, that's the cat responds by instinct, but but for a human, it's, you know, you respond because you have a memory, you know, it's like, oh, I remember that if I put my hand on the stove, it, it's not good. So I don't mm -hmm. do like that. Right. And yeah, you know, so but for us, like the um, emotional learning is notoriously resistant to updating. Um, so, you know, mm -hmm. I could have, you know, someone, you know, engaging in certain types of behaviors that are clearly, you know, dysfunctional for them, not getting them what they want. And yet, you know, they were functional when they were three years old with their alcoholic mom. Yeah. And, and they know that the world is not full of their alcoholic mom. And yet the emotion, you know, the, the part that decides what they say and do in the moment will not update. This is interesting, Howie. We, we we come back to the. You, you seem to be a Freud, sort of more of a Freudian than I am. I uh, um, just in this. I'm just saying this in the sense that uh, you know. I, I I think we come back again to the theme of sort of in, influenced by childhood, uh, you know, as opposed to sort of rational influence. But um, I, and I'm not, I'm not sure to, to to the extent that that I I I, I agree how the the importance of that influence. But on the other hand. Um, for various reasons, we are often motivated not to update. Okay. So, I mean, it's a lot more comfortable to maintain one's current views. So if you have, you know, sort of a worldview that you feel comfortable with, like, you know, you're a, you know, kind of a, a liberal or a conservative, then uh, it's easier to uh, ignore information that is dissonant with your, your current set of beliefs. And to mm -hmm. uh, and to focus on information that's consonant with it, and so that's that's how, that's why that's why when two different people, you know, somebody sort of a right leaning person, a left leaning person, see the same news item, they interpret it differently. You know, yeah. they they see what they want to see in it. So so I don't know I don't know how I don't know how much that you know I would say that sort of goes back. I mean, you can say that goes back to childhood because we learn often these these you know political beliefs early in life. And uh, and and then they can they can become settled, yeah. but um, but I think of it I think of it I don't think of it as something that's kind of below the surface you know that sort of your three year old self is sort of you know without your consciousness sort of asserting itself I think of it more as just um, uh, you know just sort of pleasure versus pain that that, that it's painful to to uh, mm -hmm. be confronted with dissonant information and so we suppress that information it's more pleasurable to see something that is consonant and so. You know, given the choice, we'd like to see something through a lens that is, it confirms uh, our sense of who we are. Right. But you, one of the things that I got from your article is a kind of a meta um, thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was being so high and intellectual until I couldn't come up with another word, but thing. Um, <laughs> that so when you you, you were talking about like <clears throat> ide you know identity, like the self signaling. And, and it, how it relates to this idea, the idea of learning, of gaining skill, gaining mastery. And so, uh, you know, I don't know the end of your windsurfing story, whether you're able to windsurf. Um, yeah. I'm imagining I was able, at some point. I, yeah, I was. I, I mean, I, I really was. I, I, I mean, by the end of, you know, whatever, two hours or so, I was definitely able to stay on the wind on the board for a period of time. And I even... I took a second lesson and I even learned to turn. I mean, I wouldn't be able to like stay on indefinitely. I'd fall off eventually, but I could stay on for longer and longer time. I think I'd, I'd crossed a threshold where, you know, the, the beginning of the learning curve was very steep and then it had begin, begun to flatten out. And so it was getting, uh -huh. it was getting easier to take the next, the steps from there. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> now I haven't windsurfed since then. So if I went back and did it again, I'd probably have to come back up the learning curve again. Mostly, actually not entirely, because I think some of the muscle memory would still be there. It would probably be mm -hmm. quicker the next time, even though I'm also seven years older. But I, I think, uh, but, but I would have, so yeah, so, so I had really come up the curve and I, I definitely learned it. Okay. So here's where I want to go meta. So you spent however many dozens of hours learning to windsurf and through all the, um, the falling off and getting back on, you changed your perception of yourself from I'm not a windsurfer to oh, I'm kind of a windsurfer. That, and that's one instance of, of, of fake it till you make it. Yes. The meta part is, like, if you do this 10 times <laughs> with different things, you become a person who then can enjoy the shitty part, right? The, now, you're now the person who enjoys being the incompetent beginner, that, yes. that, that, that that can transform. It's no longer painful, but it's kind of fun. Like, oh, I'm going to learn this new thing and I'm going to suck at it for three weeks. I'm so excited. Absolutely. I, I think that's a very important part of this. And because I think when you learn something, like when I learned, when I did the windsurfing and, and, and threw myself at it and it was really difficult and I got over the hump, a cup. I learned not just windsurfing. I learned win, I learned to windsurf, but I learned another thing. I learned, or I updated rather, in the direction of I can basically do just about anything. I mean, I, I mean that's a, that's a, that's a bit of a leap. But there was there's a if 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 you you know if you ask me to say how much I agree with the statement I can do anything I put my mind to, that was definitely updated more in the direction of I believe that more firmly. So every time. I think every time we attempt something difficult and succeed at it, we're also updating this notion that we can succeed at anything we put our mind to. And that's what turns a trend. That's, that's the thing that I think is sort of more meta transformative, if you will, that you were talking about, sort of, you know, a transformative on a grander scale that, that, that we can become a, a, a person who can, who can tackle the new thing, whatever it may be, who will throw mm -hmm. themselves at thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and the thing that's different from the thing that we think we we already know how to do. Like if you were going to learn, you know, another facet of behavioral economics or another, you know, style of probabilistic thinking, you'd be like, yeah, okay, I can get, you know, I can add that to my yeah. collection, but becoming a windsurfer or a ballroom dancer or, you know, just something that we, we when we look at ourselves, and we, we find our, those perceived limits. And meditation is a great place to, to, hit, to hit, you know, to run up against them. Then to say, okay, what, what would disconfirm that that would be kind of cool and fun? And then just yeah. you know, start collecting those experiences, I think, I think comes back to what you're saying about like, this is a good life, not a life in which I'm just jerked around by my programming. Or my, you yeah. know, my intrinsic, you know, inner and outer programming. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's almost a theorem of learning that the bigger the discontinuity, the, the, the thing that you attempt that is more outside of yourself, that is more dramatically outside of who you conceive yourself to be, the more meta updating there is, the more you're going to say, hey, I can really do things that I don't, you know, the sen my sense of self is much more expansive than what I had conceived before. If we're constantly learning things that are very close into our comfort zone, if you will, we're not expanding our sense of, of ourselves as, as being, you know, including more and more things. We have to, you have to push those limits. You have to go outside your comfort zone to expand your comfort zone. Yeah. I'm thinking about the value of fiction here because you know just about every good story will you know will include that like there's a character arc of you know at the beginning no at the end yes at the yeah. beginning right that there's they're, epics. They're like yeah epic growth are like, especially yeah I mean I'm thinking about what I'm think what I'm thinking about right now is I just saw I just saw Dune part 2 right 
Okay. And so, uh -huh. yeah, if you know the story of Dune, right? There's a character who starts out as like a 15 year old and yeah, he's been gotten some, tr you know, training as a, as a warrior, you know, from his, from his masters and so forth. But, you know, he's just, he's just a kid. And during the course of this movie, you know, without word and book, actually, if you've read the book, um, he, he really, he really transforms. He, he does things, he does things that are outside his comfort zone, you know, and there's any number of things that you can point to, including riding a giant sandworm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I mean, um, so, so it's, yeah, it, it's any great stories, you know, great uh, narratives, um, especially epics, I think have that element. Yeah, and I think it also sort of, you know, everyday stories, uh, you know, like they're only, they're only, it's almost like a formula, like the person, even, you know, like a comedy, the, the protagonist early on fails at X and then near the, you know, the, the punchline has to be the, you know, the payoff has to be, they have to have another opportunity that's higher stakes and this time they step up Whether well, you know, it could be, you know, like Paul Blart mall cop, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> like, like that's, that's the story that we groove to. I mean, there's a reason that, that, you know, movies and video games and, and, and fiction, you know, are, are, are so appealing to us. I think there is something in all of us that, that prefers to challenge our preferences. Yeah, it's funny that you say comedy because uh, because actually the comic elements of that, that we that we like in things that you know, we find funny in comedies very often are the mechanical. And here I'm actually I read a book by by Freud, in fact, when I was in college called uh, Jokes and their I think it's called Jokes and their relation to the unconscious. And so mm. and, and and Freud makes a sweeping generalization. In this book he says that what we laugh at he says everything that we find funny is the mechanical encrusted on the living. And, and he produces a number of examples of jokes and they're all, every single one of Freud's jokes is terrible. And, but, but anyway, yeah. but, but, it, but I think there's some truth to this, that when we see a comedy, what we find humorous about some of the characters is that is, the, is there is to the degree to which they're mechanical, you know, they're human and yet they're mechanical. They, they reliably, there's some slapstick to their behavior. There's some way in which, you know, so like, uh, let me give an example. It, 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 and I don't know, maybe this is a little bit of an obscure example, but the um, the Mel Brooks movie, uh, um, To Be or Not to Be. OK, so there's um, there's there's a lot of just like in the producers, there's a lot of Nazi characters, you know, comic Nazis in this movie. And two of the comic Nazis are played by um, uh, Charles Durning and Christopher Lloyd. And they're, they're constantly coming, the, the two of them, like two or three times in the movie, come into the same situation where Charles Durning confronts Christopher Lloyd with something. And it's and, and Christopher Lloyd has basically been in a contradictory situation where he's observed something, but he cannot tell Charles Durning what he's observed. And he just kind of like starts going, blah, 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 blah. You know, he's tripping over his tongue and then he suddenly goes, Heil Hitler. And it's almost mechanical. And it's just humorous because it's mechanical. Because he's, you know, that he's stuck in this bind, and he's just going to behave mechanically and just come up with the Heil Hitler at the end of it. Um, and a lot of a lot of comedy has that kind of mechanical aspect to it. But 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 I think also what you're zeroing in on that sort of arc of a character is almost that's almost you know what, something that we enjoy despite the comedy. So we like to laugh at the characters, but we also like to watch them progress. And that mm -hmm. part. I would argue, I, you maybe you disagree with me. I would argue that that part is not funny. It's enjoyable for a different reason. That even though we laugh at the character, we also feel something for them. We feel some pathos, and and that pathos, that 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 side of the way we feel for them is rewarded by seeing them progress, and we are actually cheering for them even as we're laughing at them. That's really interesting. That the comedy is almost like the sauce on top of. You know, that heartwarming story, you know, Mel Brooks famously defined, you know, the difference between comedy and tragedy is, uh, you know, com, com you know, com, 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 what is it? Tragedy is when I slip on a banana peel. Comedy is when you fall into an open sewer and die. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Now, what's funny about that is that that inverts 
that inverts the whole, you know, expectation. I, I, I couldn't honestly tell you what he was saying there, except that it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of the opposite of what you expect. Well, yeah, that, you know, that, that nothing that happens to me is funny. Nothing bad right. that happens to me is funny. Right, right. Yep, that's it. <laughs> yeah. So I don't, I don't want to leave this conversation without reminding you that you're an economist and that this, this is, there's, some, there's something to do with economics here. Did you have to do that? I was like in the process of updating and sort of thinking of myself as a regular person. <laughs> yeah, as, as, as a movie critic. Yeah, exactly. As a movie critic, as a philosopher, I seem to be moving more towards the philosophical, you know, yeah, that, you know, uh, but that just like, just like, you know, Michael Corleone, like, economics keeps pulling me back. <laughs> <laughs> You're an aqu aquatic athlete. Yeah. <laughs> right. So where's the economic? Yeah, you, ha you, ha you happen to do economics. So. Yes. So where's the economic content in this? Well, okay, so there's this idea of fake it till you make it, which is right that our actions can take the lead and can transform our notion of who we are, what we can do. But but at the core of this is is a, is um is some economics. So traditional economics teaches us, as I think I said at the beginning of this of our podcast here, um, that our um that we have these preferences and our, our actions follow from our preferences. But there's recent research, mostly psychological research. Um, that suggests actually there are feedbacks, that actions, that for a number of reasons, in a number of ways, our actions dictate our preferences. So, so, and so the economics of this is basically that um, we need to recognize that feedback and, 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 and a good economic model is one that's going to, is going to recognize that and explain behavior as, you know, as not just this very sort of simple mechanical thing. Um, but if I can say one thing about sort of, there's a bind that we're, we economists are, are in. Um, on the one hand, we're trying to create a science, okay? And on the other hand, that science has to be about human beings. So sciences, you know, if you take a look at like physics and chemistry and, you know, ast astronomy, right? Science describes, you know, defines laws as to the way things act is the way things behave in nature, right? And these laws are in some sense mechanical <coughs> and bless me. Sorry. And so, and so we know that, we know that a, a star with a certain mass, you know, a certain stage of its life is gonna do X, right? And that's because the whole thing is mechanical, right? You can predict that with a certainty. But humans are not, not machines. We are to some degree uh, capable of, 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 I mean, we're capable of free will, at least we believe we are. And so we're not machines. And so, so economics gets itself in this bind. We're trying to come up with laws about what humans do and assumptions about what humans do, but we're constantly going to be wrong because humans do what they do. And so we're having to, so, so a good theory though, is one that is, you know, can revise itself to take into account a lot of these other things that people do and these other, you know, possibilities. And at the same time, recognize that we're never going to nail this thing called human behavior. We're never really going to fully understand it. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's kind of my thought on the economics of this. It's like, so, so on the one hand, we have this economic theory of consumer behavior, which economists still use, even though it's wrong, because it's close enough for a lot of things. It's definitely close enough to teach undergraduates. So, you know, but, but is it, but 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 how descriptive is it? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I I think we're trying to revise the theories to be more descriptive. But I think we still have to recognize, we still have to be, you know, somewhat humble in recognizing that what we're trying to describe is the behavior of of, of people with free will, and um and we're never gonna we're never gonna fully get it. And and one of the things I feel like you've been pushing back on me a little that I really appreciate is. Um, advocating for econ for an economics that values free will and increases it through empowering people to believe that we have it, right? That you're you know that there's a deterministic quality to classical Homo economicus theory, and you're saying like when we make what we can have different theories, but there's a value in a theory that makes us higher potential beings upon learning the theory. Yes. Yes. I think that's true. I think, but you know, some of what some, so, and some of what I'm stating in this 
in this Substack uh, piece, and also in 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 my book, which is in the I'm in the process of writing, which we talked about in the last episode, Capital Actually, is not so much economics, but sort of using economics as a basis for talking about human potential, for talking about mm -hmm. what's possible, and so. And so what I'm saying, you know, in, in the book and, and also in this piece and in another of my writings very often is not is not predictive. I'm not saying, you know, that that economics says that X is possible. I'm saying that economics is, is gives us a, a, a departure point for talking about what may be possible for you. And um, and some of kind of what's exciting, I think, about at least for me in, in, in what I'm exploring here is that it, it it transcends what we know and what we believe and what we understand in economics. It, it, it almost says, OK, so there's all this this whole sort of body of, of thought on what people do. And and, you know, like the hell with that. I'm I, I can on a given day, I can do, you know, whatever I choose to do. And very often it's not maybe what you thought I was going to do as 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 a fellow social scientist. And based on your definition of capital as those stores of value that we have access to, that this is what you're talking about here is like, you know, everyone's like, oh, well, more capital is better. You know, if I have, uh, you know, two million is better than one million to have, you know, four houses is better than no houses. And you're saying like becoming a windsurfer is a store of capital. Uh, yeah. Becoming learning a wind to surfer. dance is a store of capital. These are stores of capital, but the other thing that they are, I'm going to kind of flip this on its head. When you learn something like windsurfing that's completely, as we say, outside of your wheelhouse, what is that relative to your capital? Well, you've got all this capital and the capital consists of what you can do and also what you believe you can do. And so when you do something that is so dramatically different from who you think you are, what you're in essence doing is not, I mean, maybe you're creating capital, but I think the interesting thing is that you are setting aside all of your existing capital or much of it to just mm. venture beyond it. And this, and this comes back to, to, to the book and really, you know, the notion of, of flows versus stocks. So, so when you take that leap and do something dramatically different, you're very much in a, in, in a moment of flow and not thinking about where your stocks currently lie, about, about you know, what it, who it is you are and what it is you can do. OK, you're, you're, you're transcending that. Mm -hmm. OK, so, yeah, so you're adding to capital, but all, uh, also living in flow, which we, we talked about last time is kind of a fun place. Yeah, to live, think, to live an experiential and think, think, life. And I think building the capital is really cool. So I think it's cool to learn to windsurf. But but again, I mean, what I what, what I want to kind of emphasize here is the fun is in the learning. The fun is in the departing from what you think you can do. So it's great. So that moment of learning the windsurfing is 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 where the fun is. Now, yes, now you've got something that you can do. And so next summer, because I've learned to windsurf, I can go out and I can get a windsurf board and I can windsurf. So that and that will be fun. That will be enjoyable because I'll, you know, I'll I'll enjoy it in the moment doing that. But 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 the but I think a lot, I think that a, a uniquely exciting opportunity is in the in the transcendence of what it is you think you can do. Okay. Because you see, now once I've learned to windsurf, now I know I can do that. So it is part of my capital and it is no longer something that I uh, can transcend. So it's the next challenge that is the thing I'm, the thing that is transcendent, right? right. And, you know, you, you could learn to windsurf the way you did with the sort of beginner's mind and delight. And I could learn to windsurf cursing and putting myself down and being frustrated and miserable. We could both end up with the same capital. Oh, I did everything that you just said you would do. Oh, <laughs> I don't oh, want to. Okay. I don't want to tell you that I wasn't cursing or putting myself down. I, but, but no. But on the at the same time, I also was laughing at myself because I was like, "This is ridiculous," you know. It, it, it was almost, but I almost had to get to that moment by going through the moments of like cursing and saying, you know, "Oh, maybe I'm just never going to get to this." I had to just keep at it until I kind of got to the point where it was just humorous. Yeah. And but that experience in and of itself is a, a form of capital that you can apply the next time something worthwhile is a pain in the ass. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Okay. Dan, Dan Ariely talks about um, um, he, um, what is it? Uh, 
losing the phrase, um, benign masochism. <laughs> like, like how people who do CrossFit or triathlons revel in how much X sucked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You probably, maybe you've seen these t-shirts that say, um, seek discomfort, right? right. Um, yeah, that's benign masochism. So it's, it's like, and, and, and runners always talk about that. We talk about, you know, it's like the great thing about running is how unpleasant it is. Um, yeah. so you know, those t-shirts always fit though. I, that, that doesn't make sense to me. They should be like, oh, the, the discomfort the shirts. Yeah. They ought to yeah. be here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it made an uncomfortable burlap or something. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so so what were we talking about? Yeah, I, I think I think that so you can learn, right? It can be a part of your capital to 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 know that you can experience, you know, this kind of uh, uh, discomfort that you can challenge yourself in, in unpleasant ways. And that that can itself be a source of, uh, you know, ironically, of enjoyment, um, right. you know, so right. It, 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 so in some sense, that is capital. That is capital as well. But um, I, I want to, you know, I'm, 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 I'm going to keep on arguing this. You, you, you keep hemming me in with capital, Howie, and I'm going to keep on saying, well, the best cool. moment that when you don't think there is any capital hemming you in in the situation at all, when you feel like you have no capital for it. OK, mm -hmm. it, 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 that's, I think, an astonishing moment. And it's a very in a lot of ways, it's a hard moment to find. But sometimes it just finds you. And it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, it's truly, I think it's, it's those moments that are the most transformational. Um, you well, know, it's a it, surrender. Yes. It's a, it's a surrender. Really. It really is a surrender. It's, 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 you know, it's, it was for me that, you know, that moment of laughter and windsurfing where I really just didn't, you know, I just had to, I just had to just, you know, it same it sort of give it up without giving up. You know, just like saying this is ridiculous was like was was me saying, I don't even know what tools I'm calling upon to do this right now, except just mm -hmm. brute force. I mean, not brute force, but pure, pure perseverance, just saying just mm -hmm. just say, let's get back up on the board again, regardless. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's all. That's also like a theme of ethics is that the magical item that you got that, that fueled the, your initial transformation of your self-identity fails you in the moment, you know, Harry Potter's wand breaks, right? You know, Luke loses his hand, he can't use his lightsaber, like, all of a sudden, all the all the capital that you had falls away, and you're naked yeah. with your soul facing this challenge. I, I thought of a different true. moment in Star Wars in episode four, where he turns off his 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 computer. And, and uh, oh, right. you know, oh, Luke, you've turned off your computer. Are you OK? He's like, yes, I'm fine. You know, because he's using the force at that point. Right. So, yeah. 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 Oh, when you said episode exactly, four, yeah. I, I, mean, I, I, I were. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was going to say one of the ones yeah. I haven't seen, but episode four was the first one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Probably like me. You saw it when you were 11. <laughs> Yep, it was. Uh, well, for was twelve, you were twelve. Arm. You're an older than me, yeah. So you you, you were probably twelve, yeah. Yeah, nineteen nineteen seventy seven or seventy. Yeah. Yep, I saw it at the up in the up in the hill on like Northfield and West Orange. That yeah, that's extreme. That's where I saw it too. Yes. It's <laughs> <laughs> exactly where I saw it. Cool. All right. Well, uh, in my mind, I'm taking us out with the. Uh, you know the um, the the John Williams theme. <laughs> so may, may may the force be with us, and and may we do funky things with it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. May the force may the force be with us. May may you you know just imagine may may you fake it till you make it in that in that Star Wars font. You know, <laughs> <laughs> love it. So how, uh, where can people read the site? Your Substack, follow you. Um, yeah, um, I guess uh, what I should. Should I provide you the link and you'll put it in the notes or something? Or I can do that, but honestly, most people don't read the notes. So if you say okay. it out loud or give pe give people a heuristic to look it up. All right, here here go the reading glasses. I'm gonna find it here. Okay, so it is. So my my Substack is. I guess you start with https colon slash yeah, slash blah blah blah. Matthewgnagler.substack.com. 
Matthew G. Nagler, N-A-G-L-E-R, at Substack.com. On the no, I'm sorry, people not, just... not at Substack.com. I'm sorry, dot Substack.com. Dot yeah. Substack. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you're going to, you're going to the URL. And probably if you just enter here, I'm going to try it right now. If you just enter Matthew G. Nagler, dot Substack.com, yes, you end up at my Substack. Matthew G. Nagler dot Substack dot com. It pulls my Substack up and it puts fake it till you make it right at the top because that's my most recent installment. Very good. And um, I don't know how happy you're going to be to hear this. When I just did a, a, a search for Matthew Nagler Substack, the first thing that came up was Betsy Nagler. Is that a fact? Yeah. I've produced and directed documentaries and wired everyone from Carrie Bradshaw to Elmo. Uh, oh, that doesn't come up when I do a search on Matthew Nagler's Substack. I get my Substack at the top. Oh, good. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm using uh, I'm using a Google alternative. Oh, I'm using Google. So, so well, so. most people will be. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for, it's good. for the for the better or for the worse. <laughs> Is that not Betsy Nagler a relative? That's my sister. You, yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I knew they had a sister named Betsy Nagler. I didn't know if she was the... And she has a substack, the, yes. Yeah. She was your, your substack competition. Well, maybe, she, she'll, yeah. maybe she'll link to you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she knows I have a substack, I think. My mother follows me. I'm not sure if my sister does. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, cool. Matt, thank you so much. This has been tons of fun. Yeah, it was a pleasure again, Howie. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you for having me on again. Yeah, write something else. We'll do it again. Okay, we will do. All right, take care. Bye. See ya. See ya. <laughs>